Paul, when I think of breakthroughs in science, I think of you. You personify, to me, breakthroughs. What do breakthroughs mean to you? Well, it's really kind of you to think of me in context of breakthroughs. They divide it really into two categories, the breakthroughs by the scientific community as a whole, and then those little personal breakthroughs that make life in science so rewarding. Uh, some of these totally transform the way we think about the world. And it may be the discovery of a new subatomic particle or a new object in space, or it may be somebody's idea that suddenly uh, brings everything into focus. Uh, and the effect that those sorts of breakthroughs have on practicing scientists is really quite varied. So for me, I've always been passionate about science from very earliest age. And so I would follow the breakthroughs that were occurring uh, during my uh, early years and think, I'd love to work on that. That's the sort of thing I mm -hmm. want to work on. But I tend to be a little bit distracted because, of course, if there's a breakthrough in another field, I think, well, I want a part of that too. <laughs> and so my career has uh, been a series of sort of going where the action is. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say I like to be a theoretical physicist and not an experimental physicist is because theoretical physics moves as fast as the speed of thought. <laughs> and so uh, I've chased after the great thoughts and the great ideas and the great discoveries. But then at a very personal level, I like to think uh, that I have made my own breakthroughs. Now, of course, less significant, mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless important to me. And uh, these often occur after a, a long period of work and then suddenly, boom, you know, it all comes together. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, obviously, if you achieve something like that, what you then want to do is to continue working in that field. I've, I've suddenly had a great insight. I think this is going to be important. Uh, and then you, you develop that with What, what are some examples that you've worked on that way? Uh, a very early one uh, is, goes under the title of the arrow of time. And so this is the familiar experience that the future and the past are very different from each other. But pinning down exactly what the source of that difference is turns out to be remarkably difficult. And I was inspired by a lecture by the British cosmologist Fred Hoyle mm. uh, at the Royal Society in the late 1960s. I was still a student. And he was talking about how Maxwell's equations, which describe the propagation of light and electromagnetic waves generally, say like radio waves, are symmetric in time. Uh, and yet, of course, we all know that when we tune into a TV show, we're receiving the show a little bit after it was transmitted, never a little bit before. Uh, and yet, according to the equations, everything should work forwards and backwards in the same way. So what is it that breaks that symmetry? And it was, was and still remains a contentious issue. But I, I, I like to think that I myself made a contribution to pulling that field together. It turns out that you can trace the origin of this arrow of time back to the origin of the universe, that the universe was set up we don't know how, in a rather special state. Uh, but putting all that together and bringing in gravitation, which plays a really key role in this, uh, was uh, quite an effort. And I'm proud of the fact that I knocked that subject into shape uh, in, in the mid-1970s. I actually wrote, wrote a book on it. It was my first book, and it turned out to be very influential. I never expected that at the time. Mm. Uh, what, what, was the, what were some of the key insights of that? When you think about the early universe, you think about the cosmic background heat radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that radiation turns out to be very, very close to what we call thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, that is to say, if we could magically go back to the very early stages after the Big Bang, we would find there would just be uniform temperature throughout. Mm -hmm no variation, everything settled down into equilibrium. Uh, but the distinctive feature of the universe today is it's very far from equilibrium. We've got a hot sun and cold mm -hmm. space, for example, and that drives almost all of the processes that are asymmetric in time on the Earth's surface. So how did we get to disequilibrium from equilibrium? Because the fundamental law of physics called the second law of thermodynamics says everything's supposed to go the other way. Mm -hmm. Things are supposed to go from disequilibrium to equilibrium, a drive towards entropy, uh, the heat death of the universe, and so on. So it seems like it's back to front. But the key point is once you include gravitation, you realize that the early universe was actually in a state very far from equilibrium. From the point of view of gravitation, matter would like to be black holes. But it was not black holes in the early stages. Everything's very smoothed out. 
uh, and it's since become more and more clumpy. So putting gravitation into the picture solved about half of the problem mm -hmm. of the origin of the arrow. What are some other um, uh, breakthroughs that you've had uh, outside of physics or applying physics to other fields because you've been remarkably uh, fecund in being able to see different areas? Uh, I got interested in the subject which is now called astrobiology in mm -hmm. the 1990s. And here was a, a curious story because uh, in the late 1980s, it was discovered that there are meteorites on Earth which looked like they had come from Mars, and people were very baffled. How did they get here? Well, we now know that Earth and Mars take a hit from time to time by asteroids and comets with enough power to splatter rocks all around the solar system. So that mechanism is now understood, but at that time, it was a bit mysterious. And I learned about that. And then the, uh, the other thing I learned about uh, was influenced very much by uh, astrophysicist Thomas Gold at Cornell University. And he had this, what was then a crazy idea, that life extends deep under the ground. Almost nobody believed him. But I thought, this is the type of uh, crazy idea that I love. And uh, I took it seriously. And then I put two and two together. Well, if life exists in the rocks deep under the ground, or the rocks go splattered around the solar system. Doesn't that mean life can be conveyed from Earth to Mars, say, or Mars to Earth? And maybe if life started on Mars and came to Earth, maybe we're all descended from Martians. <laughs> uh, and I remember yeah. suggesting this idea in the early 90s, and nobody was going to take it seriously. And in the mid 90s, I was even denounced uh, <laughs> over dinner at a conference in London, having presented this view. Not only was it crazy, it was so crazy uh, that it made a dinner time conversation. Uh, but very sh shortly thereafter, the idea became accepted uh, the, uh, the, largely because of the discovery of a meteorite in Antarctica mm. uh, called the Allen Hills meteorite. Uh, and it was made famous by none other than President Bill Clinton, who mm. stood on the White House lawn and announced that NASA had evidence for life on Mars <laughs> in the form of this meteorite. Uh, and the meteorite has these little features which may or may not be fossilized Martians, probably not, is yeah. the current view. But at the time it looked pretty exciting, and I think people felt, well, if fossilized Martians can come here, perhaps live Martian microbes can come here in a meteorite, and suddenly yeah. uh, these ideas became accepted. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's one example of the, of the process. In more, more recent years, I've become more interested uh, in the crossover between physics and biology, the, the whole problem of life's origin. Mm -hmm. Where does physics leave off and biology begin? And do we need new laws to describe that? And, and I think that's a breakthrough waiting to happen.